it would be wrong to say it's affected our planning, but right to say that it, it, it's caught our eye because we can see uh, confrontation there that has raised concerns amongst our NATO partners. Uh, we're very aware to our, of our commitments to Article 5, and we'll, with, with our uh, partners uh, in NATO, we'll look very carefully at what this means for the way we might need to train and operate in the future, but it's very early days. We live in a, an ever-changing world. How easy is it to predict future threats and, and conflicts and be prepared for those in the modern age? I, I don't think it's ever been the case that, that uh, anybody has ever really predicted the future. You, you, you can make an assessment of, of trends and you can learn the lessons of, of history, but the important thing for the armed forces is to be ready for uncertainty. Uh, and I think there are many examples in our, in our history, both recent and more distant, where we've had to respond to things that absolutely did not uh, appear on any forecast of events. And I would say that in, in my own service, all the major things that I've participated in, Bosnia, Kosovo, Iraq, Afghanistan, none of them were foreseen. And, and what it, it, it does mean is the armed forces have to be ready to embrace the unexpected and to be able to respond from a broad-based set of capabilities. And your role is di to directly support the defence objectives, uh, especially for current operations. How will the face of the military on operations uh, after the withdrawal of Afghanistan, how's that going to look? Well, I think um, some of this will depend on how the world turns out, but there are a couple of things I'm very confident about. The first is we, we will reset our contingent capabilities. So the role of the armed forces to be able to respond principally from bases in the UK to a drama around the world, we, we'll re-establish that in the shape of a much improved joint expeditionary force. And the second thing I'm confident about is that we will continue to commit to a whole range of engagement activities around the world so we're able to uh, influence, uh, to engage with our partners, to build capacity, to understand the world better. And all of that will be an essential precursor to any future military activity. And how difficult is it trying to get all those services, all three services, to work together in an era when our armed forces, their numbers, they're being cut? Now, you know, I think as time has passed, um, most people in most of the services have acquired truly joint instincts. And it would be, they were, in their view, they would see it exceptional to be committed to an operation which wasn't truly joint. And I think that's one of the major legacies, in fact, of the last, uh, last 10 years. Now, that doesn't mean that the services, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, shouldn't retain the, the, the absolute gold standard of excellence within their own environment. That's the first thing to get right. But they all expect to come together in a joint force. So I don't see this as a challenge in terms of our approach to it. It's a challenge in just doing it well because it's quite difficult. And finally, what does the future hold? What sort of role are our armed forces going to have here in the Falklands and across the South Atlantic, do you think? No, I don't think the role in the Falklands here uh, is likely to, to change and certainly not to, to diminish. And we will continue to reassure the Falkland Islanders that their commitment uh, that they've made recently through a referendum uh, to, uh, to remain British will be underpinned by uh, the efforts that we uh, put in here in the Falklands and we'll continue to deter those that want to challenge that. That's, that's not new and it's not going to change.